Okay, well, why don't we uh, get started? And, and we're transitioning into a, um, a phase of uh, where we're going to be talking, there'll be a number of talks on acute kidney injury. And my role uh, will be to sort of introduce uh, the pathophysiology to, to hopefully context, allow you to contextualize uh, the other course, the other uh, talks, which will be more um, devoted to specific aspects of, of acute kidney injury and, and have more cases um, associated uh, with them. So mine will be uh, an introduction in an attempt to sort of give you an idea in 30, 35 minutes of, of where the field is with regard to pathophysiology. Um, by way of disclosures, um, most of uh, uh, these disclosures relate to um, consultation for patient safety. Um, uh, we, we do a good deal of uh, uh, biomarker studies, as you know, and, um, and a, a number of companies are concerned about whether or not one of their drugs are safe uh, for patients. And, and um, there are some other aspects, including uh, the National Space Biology Research Institute, um, which I'm a member of the board of directors on. That's an academic collaboration. So let me start with a case, 74-year-old um, uh, male, uh, status post-cholecystectomy, who has an increase in his serum creatinine from a baseline of 1.5 to 2.1 in the last 48 hours. He has a history of hypertension, coronary artery disease, and pancreatitis, and is on lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, and naproxen. Uh, he has a blood pressure of 90 over 50, a temperature of 102, and 2 plus lower extremity edema. Has a urine output of 250 cc's for the last 12 hours. And on urine analysis, he has 2 plus protein, um, negative for blood, and pH of 5. And on urine sediment, has a few uh, non pigmented granular casts. So there are a couple of questions which. Um, which uh, one comes comes to mind here that I, I'll I'll talk about throughout the um, uh, the subsequent uh, thirty minutes. So does he have acute kidney injury? That's one question. Uh, what are the pathophysiological processes um, responsible for this? Uh, will a change in his creatinine, uh, one point five to two point one, have short and long-term consequences uh, for mortality and chronic kidney disease. Should he be given volume? Would any biomarkers be helpful? Um, obviously, creatinine is a biomarker. Um, would other biomarkers uh, be helpful? And so I'm going to divide the talk in the context of diagnosis and terminology first, and then links between AKI and CKD, uh, therapeutic guidelines and approaches, and, and at the end, uh, some comments on, on uh, uh, biomarkers. So this is a study that actually uh, came out of uh, the Brigham uh, by uh, Glenn Chertow uh, when he was here. He's now at Stanford. Um, and, and it basically uh, looked at hospital survival uh, stratified by changes in creatinine, and <clears throat> and also the um, incidence of uh, of AKI uh, if you define it uh, in a certain way, depending on creatinine changes. So, if you define, let's say, at this starting from the right first, if you define uh, AKI by a change in creatinine of two milligrams per deciliter then the incidence is relatively low in the hospital, but, but the mortality is pretty high. Uh, as you go down, you can see that clearly as you define in a more permissive way uh, IKI by a change in creatinine, let's say of greater than 0.3, uh, the incidence is quite high, up around beyond 30%. Um, but the mortality is also um, uh, reasonable, in a sense, or unreasonable. In other words, the odds ratio for death is quite uh, significant, even though 
the change in creatinine is only 0.3 or 0.4. And so, so this, this study, as well as another study um, that was done in surgical patients at the Cleveland Clinic, served as a, um, a bellwether for drawing attention to these smaller changes in creatinine as being significant and ultimately led to changes in definition of um, what previously was called acute renal failure to uh, acute kidney injury uh, to reflect the fact that uh, the kidney didn't have to fail in order for the, uh, um, the, the state of the kidney to uh, change uh, in such a way that it would uh, be detrimental uh, in a predictive way to patient outcome. And so um, <clears throat> the KDGO definition of, um, of AKI uh, is as follows. Basically, a change in creatinine uh, greater than or equal to 0.3 milligrams per deciliter, or in, in um, um, other uh, units here, 26 micromoles per liter, uh, within 24 hours, or serum creatinine rises to 1.5-fold from, from the reference value, which is known or presumed to have occurred within one week. Or the urine output is less than 0.5 mLs per kilogram per hour for greater than six consecutive hours. So you can quibble with this definition, and I particularly don't like the urine output definition, uh, because um, it, in many situations, somebody who's a distance runner, for example, may not be producing very much urine, um, and by this definition, they would have acute kidney injury. Uh, this is really most relevant. The urine output definition is most relevant for the hospitalized patient in the ICU in particular. Now, there's also a staging. So in addition to the definition of AKI, um, there are different stages, one, two, and three. And <clears throat> these are not that um, uh, mysterious. Uh, the, the greater the change in creatinine, the higher the stage. And there are many, many papers in the literature uh, that show that the uh, greater the stage of AKI, the worse the outcome is. Uh, and likewise, the urine output drops uh, for uh, during this period of time and can be, therefore, uh, can define a stage two if this uh, urine output drop lasts for 12 hours. The details, honestly, are not that particularly important um, clinically, except to say that the, um, the worse the change in creatinine, the worse the patient is going to do. But even with small changes in creatinine, uh, the odds ratio for death is, is pretty high. Uh, and so we have to pay attention to these small changes. And here's the hospital survival. This is put, just put another way, um, looking at the different stages of AKI. So with stage three um, AKI, this is patient survival at hospital discharge. And you can see that there's a 40% um, a a uh, drop off in survival. Risk factors for developing AKI. Uh, <clears throat> this lists things that you uh, um, already uh, probably know, but uh, elderly patients, uh, patients with chronic kidney disease are, are particularly prone to developing acute on chronic kidney disease, uh, cardiac failure, peripheral vascular disease, liver disease, diabetes, nephrotoxic medication, hypovolemia, and sepsis. And studies suggest that 30% of the cases may be preventable. And in particular, in certain parts of the world, um, this number of 30% may be even much higher. Um, there are places that are endemic right now, um, Sri Lanka, for example, or uh, Central America, um, where it's believed that there are um, uh, causes of acute and chronic kidney disease that are even um, um, have a higher incidence of being preventable potentially. It's just that we don't exactly understand how to prevent them. The other thing, the other concept which is not being used um, 
in the context of uh, clinical care so much, but I think is important in terms of thinking about the pathophysiology and what's going on with our patients, is this issue of, of renal reserve. And, and so if you're a young individual um, with a significant uh, a tubular insult, uh, uh, either a nephrotoxicant or an ischemic insult or a septic insult, um, you can have a significant injury to the kidney without much of a change in creatinine. And why does that occur? Is because the kidney can adapt and can, can increase its GFR um, to those nephrons that are still functioning. And that renal reserve, that's what's called renal reserve. It's basically the, the, um, what the increase in GFR that you can get uh, because of uh, stress. And here you can see a number of things. If this is the baseline GFR, um, if you introduce a number of stressful uh, inputs, you could potentially get uh, what you could call a stress uh, GFR um, and, and you can mark the increase that GFR. Now that, that fraction of the, um, of, of, or the, the renal reserve decreases with age um, and it decreases with uh, chronic kidney disease. So if you go down here in chronic kidney disease stage three, um, you basically have very little renal reserve. So any change, any new insult to the kidney is actually gonna be seen uh, as a change in creatinine. Uh, and, and so the, uh, the sensitivity of creatinine is very dependent on the, um, the underlying renal function and the renal reserve. So it's really a very, very insensitive marker for individuals with normal renal function. Um, it's a more sensitive marker for patients with uh, chronic kidney disease. It also will depend a little bit on, um, on your diet. So here's a, um, a patient who's a vegetarian. Uh, their baseline GFR uh, may be a little bit low. It's not into the abnormal range, but um, you know, maybe a little bit low because of being a vegetarian. And yet their renal reserve is quite significant if you tested that renal reserve because they have good kidneys. It's just being a vegetarian means generally that you're your GFR, measured GFR, is less. And here's another way of looking at this that yeah, I don't like the term cl clinical attack, um, but I just took this slide from a, from a paper, I think it's an instructive slide, where you basically have, have a normal baseline GFR um, and a quote in normal range. So if you start out up here and you have some problem in the kidney that's reversible, uh, you're not going to get out of the um, uh, GFR range that we would consider normal or s above normal. Um, but as you had more bouts of acute kidney injury, let's say, you ultimately um, will decline your kidney function. Uh, in each case, you'll have a decline which may bring you out of the, the normal range and clearly, once you uh, develop chronic kidney disease, you're going to be uh, even seeing these bouts of AKI, that is <clears throat> a measurable reduction in GFR uh, that is um, uh, routinely seen with patients with chronic kidney disease. And here's another example. This is a giving a pre protein load to a patient who's um, a group of patients, relatively small numbers here, but 25-year-olds where uh, the baseline renal function as measured by GFR was 122 mLs per minute, and after giving a protein load, it was 20, 226. So this is quite dramatic. Uh, on the other hand, if you take a 77-year-old group uh, with a baseline GFR of 51, there's still some renal reserve. Giving that uh, protein load, um, you can still see a, um, an increase in, creatin in GFR uh, but the delta GFR is obviously much less than it is in a younger individual um, with, um, with more uh, normal kidneys. Okay, so, so there are a number of things which uh, now transitioning a bit to pathophysiology per se, um, there are a number of things which affect the kidney function and a number of them feed into a generalized or localized reduction in renal blood flow. 
These can be small vessel diseases, large vessel diseases, um, uh, congestive heart failure, cirrhosis, uh, <clears throat> peritonitis where there's third spacing and defective uh, decreased intravascular volume and a number of medications um, which can have their own toxicity at the level of the tubule but can also uh, markedly affect uh, regionally or, or sometimes more generalized but, but often regionally a, re uh, a, a reduction in renal blood flow. And in terms of thinking about the pathophysiology at the microvascular level, at the glomerular level, uh, or the medullary vasculature, there's essentially too much vasoconstriction, too little vasodilatation in response to agents that are normal, normally vasodilating the vascular bed, too much in the way of endothelial and vascular smooth muscle cell damage, and too much leukocyte endothelial adhesion. Uh, this redu reduction or this vasoconstriction, basically, and blockage of small vessels by inflammatory responses, this then decreases oxygen delivery to the tubules, and the tubule cells then go through a series of changes um, depending on how severe the oxygen delivery uh, reduction is uh, that can vary from loss of polarity of these cells or cytoskeletal breakdown uh, to cell death and loss of the cells into the lumen with tubular obstruction and back leak of glomerular filtrate and appearance in the urine of casts and, and other tubular cells. And these tubular abnormalities will in turn um, result in inflammatory and vasoactive mediators working on the vasculature. So you have a positive feedback process um, whereby uh, you, you have a vascular problem and a tubular problem and then a vascular problem because of the tubular problem. And so here's uh, also a contextual slide to think about the kidney in, in, uh, in a very um, stylistic way in this cartoon, thinking about the outer medulla of the kidney in particular um, where this being the cortex, outer medulla, uh, inner medulla. <clears throat> in the outer medulla, there are these vessels which feed the, um, the interstitial region uh, coming off the vasorecta bundles and provide oxygen to the thick ascending limb and to the S3 segment of the proximal tubule. And this, in particular, the S3 segment of the proximal tubule is very dependent on oxygen. Uh, it can't convert to glycolytic metabolism the way the thick ascending limb can. And so if you reduce the blood flow to this region of the kidney, uh, you're going to have the maximum effect in a detrimental way on the S3 segment. The other thing to remember is that there's an oxygen gradient in going from cortex to papilla tip, as reflected here um, by, by oxygen tension. And this is a result of short-circuiting of oxygen from the vessels moving down into the medulla to the vessels bringing um, fluid away from the medulla back into the cortex. And so the oxygen short-circuits, this is because of the structure, the countercurrent exchange structure of the medulla, and, and this is the price you pay for being able to concentrate the urine. So we're not going to talk about concentration of the urine, but, but these vasorecta bundles allow for preservation of a concentration gradient from cortex to papilla tip. But the price you pay is this oxygen uh, short circuiting. And so if you start out hypoxic and you reduce flow to the outer medulla, you're going to have even more problems. And here, from a, from a clinical relevance here, I'm going to come back to this when we talk about volume. Um, and, um, and make, make the point that when you treat patients with AKI uh, with large amounts of volume in the same way that you see edema in their periphery, um, you're probably producing edema in the, in the outer medulla of the kidney and making uh, them more prone to uh, kidney dysfunction. And here's just another example of this. These are the vessels. Uh, and this is a human kidney showing the obstruction uh, 
in these vessels, um, potentially related to edema in the area of the outer medulla. The other important thing which is becoming more and more apparent is the glycocalyx, an endothelial injury. Uh, we, we talk about endothelial injury as it relates to, uh, to the glomerulus, um, <clears throat> and, and that's reflected on the left-hand slide of this slide here. There are, um, are various components uh, to the, um, the integrity of the glycocalyx here, and, and this glycocalyx gets shed when there's injury to the glomerulus, as there as can occur after AKI and other stage, other inflammatory diseases that involve the glomerulus. Um, but there also the glycocalyx is shed in the context of the, um, the peritubular capillaries. And when it's shed, then that predisposes to inflammatory cells basically attaching to um, the endothelial layer. <clears throat> and this uh, promotes the inflammatory response and also ultimately results in obstruction to these um, peritubular capillaries and further ischemia. This is <clears throat> particularly relevant, relevant in, um, in sepsis. So one of the other, um, one of the other things that um, I've mentioned up until this point is the distribution of renal blood flow is, is very important, in particular in the outer medulla. And here is a, an attempt, early studies in the mouse, um, which hopefully, ultimately, will get translated to humans um, at the bedside because it's an ultrasound study. And here what we did in the mouse was we injected with um, contrast agent, which is microbubbles. Some of you may be familiar with this, but but it's a microbubble um, uh, contrast agent, and, and it goes throughout the body. Uh, and, and then what you can do is you can use a high energy ultrasound probe to, at one point, just um, collapse all those microbubbles in the kidney, and then watch how the microbubbles come back into the field. And so, uh, and essentially, what what you have here is that under normal circumstances, as reflected here in this mouse kidney, uh, you see the red, which means normal renal blood flow. Uh, but after ischemia, you see that there's a lot of yellow. And there are some distributions that look um, a little bit more healthy in blood flow. But essentially, it takes about 24 hours in the mouse kidney to get back to normal blood flow um, and when we quantitated this, it's, we've, been pu we've published this, but I'm not going to show you all the details. Um, the, the biggest changes in blood flow occur actually in the outer medulla, and they persist. Um, <clears throat> and so with these changes in blood flow and with this inflammatory response, uh, what happens is that there's tubular injury, as reflected by this cartoon, uh, there are changes in polarity, so normally proteins that are basolaterally located in the um, epithelium, they become more apically located. Here is reflected by these little round balls here. Uh, you lose the brush border. This is the normal brush border, normal situation. Post ischemia, you lose the brush border, um, and uh, clearly cells are dying and fragmenting also. Um, and you also expand the interstitial space with inflammatory cells. Okay, another point I want to make because this is um, there's the, uh, this is an important cause of acute kidney injury in our patients, and that is sepsis. And I want to uh, there, I want to make the point here that uh, there's a, there's confusion in the literature about this, so you'll get mixed messages. Um, some people will say, for example, that sepsis um, is not associated with um, as much uh, tubular injury as you would expect. So let's look for other causes of AKI, other pathophysiological processes associated with sepsis. So here's a statement from the literature of a, actually a very good group published in 2013. Um, 
respiratory group, but to study sepsis. Uh, um, renal tubule is common. Ruby tubule injury is common in sepsis, but, rep, but presents focally. So most renal tubule cells appear normal. The degree of cell injury and death does not account for severity of sepsis-induced organ dysfunction. Okay. On the other hand, they say in the paper that proximal tubule vacuolization is present in 77% of septic patients. And KIM-1, which is this protein that we um, identified a number of years ago, uh, we weren't involved with this study, but they said it's in present in 32% uh, at the cortical medullary junction. So I just want to point out what the nephron really looks like, because it's not really common to be seen this way in textbooks. So, so this is a, um, in the background here are some vasculature in the kidney. You can see some glomeruli, these round balls. Here. Uh, this vasculature is only filled uh, very, very minimally because if you fill the vasculature completely, you wouldn't see anything because this vasculature is so dense. So it's, it's filled just partially in order to be able to do this kind of study. And so what we did here was we went into Bowman space around the glomerulus and we filled the proximal tubule. So this is all proximal tubule. Hence the reason it's called proximal convoluted tubule. Right. And this is the part, this is the S3 segment that's now moving down into, um, throughout the rest of the cortex. This is in the mid region of the cortex. This happens to be a dog kidney, uh, but we did it also in discarded human kidneys. And, and the, the, the dog's much more organized than the human kidney is. Um, but essentially the story is the same. Uh, there, this, this tubule is perfused by multiple efferent vessels from multiple glomeruli. So if you do a section through this kidney, let's say it's a human kidney and we get a biopsy, if you do a section through this, um, it may be that these nephrons here, these nephron segments may look normal. But if you did another section up here, you would see that in fact there was necrosis in these tubules. And this whole nephron might, could very well be obstructed. It doesn't have to be ischemic throughout the entire nephron. It could only be potentially ischemic because of two glomeruli out of 10 that have been knocked out, all right? So, so when, when you hear things like looking at um, uh, tissue from humans and saying that, well, there isn't as much tubular injury, you have to go back and think about what the nephron looks like and what the perfusion of the nephron uh, is. Okay, so let me talk about the link to chronic kidney disease. Uh, this is an important link. Um, you'll hear some more about this, but essentially when <clears throat> uh, there are a number of epidemiologic studies looking at the probability of end-stage renal disease uh, if you are discharged from the hospital with a diagnosis of, um, of AKI or a diagnosis of, of AKI on CKD um, or a diagnosis of CKD alone. So actually, if you have a diagnosis of CKD, um, the, the chance that you'll be on dialysis 400 days or one year after your hospitalization is the same as if you uh, had an, an admission for AKI without CKD. Um, obviously, if you have a um, AKI on top of CKD, you have a marked increase in the chance to progress to end-stage renal disease. Um, this process of, of uh, AKI is, um, is a relatively um, uh, uh, intense one in terms of the ability of the kidney to try to repair itself. Here you can see, hopefully, um, in some cross sections in tubule, all of the debris uh, that <clears throat> is in that tubule. Uh, here you can also see this is a mouse kidney you, the, where the red and the green uh, reflect the ability of the kidney to try to repair itself. 
and go through a, a proliferative response. <clears throat> now, if you take a healthy kidney and you injure it, this reparative response can lead to a, um, a, via a number of processes to a, a kidney that's pretty close to normal. But in most cases, uh, especially in, uh, in, in the elderly or an individual who's had prior bouts of, of injury to the kidney, there's impaired repair and the development of fibrosis. Okay, and this reflects um, this stated a little different way. Um, so if you take a normal kidney and you introduce an insult, this is the epithelium with its normal brush border, you lose polarity, you then get cell death, there's a sloughing of viable and dead cells, and then there's migration of these, um, the remaining cells in an attempt to replace the damaged epithelium. Often, however, um, due to a number of processes that I won't get into at the cellular level, um, there's an inability to normally repair. And what happens is that there's a process that's set up which ultimately results in interstitial uh, fibrosis. And, and then if you have another bout of injury a little bit later, it only makes things worse. Uh, because your ability to conduct normal repair is markedly uh, prevented if you don't have a normal kidney uh, substrate uh, uh, upon which to try to repair. And so this is another depiction of this. Again, I'm not going to go through the details here, um, but you have AKI, uh, and uh, unfortunately, often it leads to CKD. And, and many of our patients... I think are having subclinical bouts of AKI, um, especially those who have rapid progression uh, to CKD. This is something that uh, our clinical colleagues, clinical investigators, are actually uh, act very actively studying and trying to understand. Because obviously if we can prevent these bouts of AKI somehow, potentially we will have an effect on progression of CKD. And here you can see there are cells in the interstitium, uh, and these cells, these parasites, come off of the blood vessels. These blue cells come off of the blood vessels. The blood vessels then suffer because of the loss of these parasites, and they then um, be become dysfunctional, and you lose, you lose vascular supply to the tubules and ultimately more ischemic injury to the tubules. So therapeutic guidelines and approaches, unfortunately, there aren't very many. Uh, these are the KDGO. Um, and unfortunately, the first comment here, there's currently no evidence to support the use of a specific pharmacological uh, therapy in the treatment of AKI. Uh, and this is something which the field has been hung up about, uh, unfortunately. There's a lot of discussion. There are a number of companies now that are trying um, to develop uh, therapeutics. Um, and, and the other comments here, which I won't go through, relate to sort of dialysis treatment and, <clears throat> and uh, bicarbonate as a preferred buffer for dialysis and microbial standards uh, for fluids uh, for chronic dialysis or dialysis in patients who are getting AKI. But let me say a little bit about the... Um, uh, the fluid thing, um, again, all of us in treating patients, in particular in the ICU, uh, run up against the patient who, you know, we're giving fluids to and they're becoming more and more edematous. Their blood pressure doesn't seem to be responding. And, um, uh, you know, and what I would just caution you with is that probably what we're doing is also causing edema uh, in the kidney, um, not proven, but... Um, but clearly, uh, many of our um, uh, in intensive care colleagues uh, are, uh, have cautioned us, and there are some studies now which show that vigorous fluid replacement is actually um, uh, more harmful than good. Okay. Um, 
With regard to thinking about the future of AKI, I was asked to put this um, slide together, thinking about uh, you know what what we might be doing in the near future. Um, I think if we look at where we will be in 2025, we'll have a better selection of high-risk patients with clinical algorithms. Um, we'll be measuring, not estimating GFR, hopefully, and we'll be measuring renal reserve. That would be my hope. Um, we'll optimize perfusion pressure, but we won't do it in the context of um, of simply sort of looking at blood pressure, hopefully what we'll do is we'll be using, using ultrasound or other methods non-invasively to look at the effects of, fus of infusion of fluids uh, on the, um, the edema, uh, the outer medullary blood flow uh, or in total blood flow of the kidney. Um, we'll minimize hemodilution to again optimize oxygen we won't use diuretics or dopamine to prevent AKI. Most of us don't now, but some still do. Um, and and uh, we'll avoid nephrotoxic drugs. We'll minimize the use of ACE, ACEs and ARBs because we'll have better therapeutics in the, ache, in the acute setting. Uh, we'll aim for a mean arterial pressure of greater than 65. Um, and the drugs that we'll develop will specifically dilate the renal vasculature, inhibit breakdown of the glycocalyx, protect the endothelial cell, protect the mitochondria, and enhance glycolysis and mitochondrial fatty acid uh, utilization. And also, finally, prevent cell cycle arrest uh, and, and senescence. So I'm going over here, and I'm, I'm not, maybe what I'll do is just prevent, present one slide for this last part. Um, what about biomarkers? And maybe a couple of slides. I will talk about one study where, whereby a number of biomarkers were um, proposed or, or tested as to whether or not they could predict stage two or three CKD within 12 hours of sample collection. This is based, there were two studies based here uh, on this. And, and what the group found was that uh, TIMP2 and IGF binding protein 7, um, especially if they were put together, uh, were better than some of the other biomarkers in predicting this. So you'll see available, and you've probably been um, uh, interviewed or, or um, uh, had a discussion with uh, sales representatives talking about, well, why don't you do these tests? Because they are uh, available now. Um, I'm not going to go into the pluses and minuses. Perhaps if some people have lunch questions or if you're going to lunch or before lunch, I'm happy to answer any um, questions about this. The only thing I would also mention, and this will be the last data slide, one, one after this, is all of these biomarkers are being compared to creatinine changes. So what we're saying is a biomarker is good because of, it increases creatinine at 12 hours. And I just want to make this point, okay? If you just do a mathematical analysis and you choose a biomarker that is perfect, so a biomarker, let's say here, is true positive, so these are really patients who had AKI, and these are true negatives. These are patients who you know don't have AKI, who, who, who again, in this um, sort of construct, uh, is the truth. This is the truth. Okay. Now you're trying to get at the truth by using these biomarkers. But if you use a, goal, a standard that has a, a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 80%, so we're using as a gold standard creatinine. And, and if you think about it, creatinine can't have a sensitivity of 80%. It has to be less than that because of all this renal reserve business. All right, but let's say it was 80% sensitive. And let's say it was 80% specific. Then the perfect biomarker, the perfect one, would be interpreted to have only a sensitivity of 50% and a specificity of 94%. And you would say, and the literature would say, well, this is not a good biomarker. 
So I just, this, this is a pervasive problem throughout the biomarker field. And because of the fact that we're using creatinine as a gold standard, uh, we've been held back in using um, uh, what I believe are better biomarkers than creatinine. So with that, getting back to the case, uh, yes, the patient has AKI because by definition, um, that's the way we're defining AKI now by a change in creatinine. Um, the, uh, the pathophysiological processes I've talked about, the change in creatinine will have short-term and long-term implications uh, in, a, in an epidemiologic way. Um, should he be given volume? Not necessarily. Uh, I just, uh, you know, depending on, depending on what his overall volume status is, uh, it, it, one should be cautious with just um, being, uh, uh, you know, uh, and not over treating with volume. It's not necessarily the case it shouldn't be given any volume, but just be cautious about, about um, the amount of volume that's given. And would any biomarkers be helpful? I would say right now there's no consensus um, that a particular other biomarker, except in the nephrotoxic case, um, would be helpful, although personally I think they would be. Um, but but um, for the purposes of this meeting, um, you know, we can't say that there's a consensus. 